Hello, everyone, and welcome to our final evening of See and Learn 2019. Woo! <laughs> First off, we do want to say thank you to each and every one of you guys for showing up with us here in the courtyard by Shea Booba. We really appreciate your presence. To those of you joining us on Facebook, thank you for tuning in with us. We do invite you to comment where you're watching from. And if you have any questions at the end of the show, please let us know, and we'll try to get your questions, questions answered for you. With that being said, we do want to give a big thank you to Carib Trans. Because of them, we're able to share it with people all around the world. <laughs> Next, we want to say thank you to Queen's Gardens for hosting our tonight's expert and making her feel at home while she's here on Saba. A big thank you to Prince Berenhard Culture Funds and the government of Saba for their generous donations and kind support. One big thank you to all of our sponsors. Without you guys, this wouldn't be possible, so thank each and every one of you for your support. And that raffle, guys, the day has come. We are going to be drawing the winners at the end of the presentation. So if you guys do want to get in this raffle, tonight is the last opportunity and to let you guys know what prizes we have going on. So top right, we have the Dawn 2 Ferry, two round trip tickets for that going back and forth from St. Martin to Saba. We have a wine gift basket from Shea Booba, a beautiful handcrafted Triton Forge knife made by John over at C. Saba, a two night stay for two people at the Travel Inn over on St. Martin, we have three prizes from Aquamania. The first is a sunset sail for two going around St. Martin. The second, two round trip tickets on the Edge Ferry going back and forth from St. Martin to Saba. And the third, a tango dinner cruise for two going around St. Martin. Really cool adventures. We have a beautiful uh, piece of glass art made by Joan Bean right here. It's going to be a mermaid surrounded by three seahorses and a beautiful sea turtle. We have for our divers out there a two for one certificate for eight days, seven nights aboard the Caribbean Explorer 2. It goes from St. Martin to Saba to St. Kitts. So a really cool diving experience for you guys. And last but definitely not least, you have two nights stay at Queens Garden Resort and Spa. So you could be staying free luxuriously. So guys, the Raffles are going to be drawn at the end of the night. Stay tuned if you're a winner, if you're already in the raffle. If you'd like to get yourself in there, just let us know, and we'll get you guys in the raffle. Only $2 per ticket. And next, we have the founder of See and Learn who would like to come up and say a few words. So please give a warm welcome to Lynn. Okay, I promised I wouldn't be on the microphone much, but I have to be on closing night. So I just want to say thank you, everyone, everyone who's come to presentations, field projects, and Facebook. And I want to say what a great uh, see and learn we had this month. And a big part of that is really owing to Emily and Tiffany. Please stand up. <laughs> they were awesome. Uh, we everything went super smoothly and some of you might say well what do they do all day I just see them sitting at the tent <laughs> well when they're sitting at the tent they're working on statistics that helps us with our future uh, funding they're organizing taxis every one of these experts comes in and out every time they go to the school every time we move people around we move chairs I'm the chief chair mover <laughs> um, they, uh, what else do we do? Oh my God. They put all the presentations together, add the loops, add the advertisers. Oh, by the way, we have to do our raffle tonight. By the way, we're going to do a trivia contest. So they do a lot of work. I think they both had 0 .3, uh, 0 0.75 days off each in the month. So again, give it up to them. And the raffle tickets, what does that pay for? Yes, we get funding and such, but there's a lot of out-of-pocket expenses. Uh, so anyway, treat yourself, spend $2, have a great time. <laughs> all right, uh, and to all our sponsors, we have Tim in the crowd, by the way. You s if you come to see and learn, you see him. He is a generous donor every year. We've got Michael, a board member. 
I took my glasses off. Who am I missing, Michael? <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but all of our sponsors from every hotel on the island, restaurants, taxi drivers, uh, dive shops, of course, uh, but so many people. So if you're walking by a sponsor, no matter who it is, tell them, hey, you know what? Thanks for supporting it because I really enjoyed the program. All that really helps us to keep this momentum going. All right. So I'm off the mic. <laughs> and up next, we're doing trivia. All right, so for those of you who've been here all month, we're going to do it as a recap and a trivia contest all at once, and it'll make those people who haven't been here all month also realize all the cool subjects uh, we covered and the take-home messages from them. It'll be quick. It'll be fun. Here we go. Thank you. Let's give a quick, big round of applause for Lynn, all that she does to put this program on. <laughs> So it's trivia time! Woo! <laughs> um, I forget the order. Okay. All right, and guys, also, for these trivia questions, if you answer it, well, attempt to answer it, answer it correctly, you guys are getting free sustainable cutlery. It is bamboo, uh, spoon, fork, and knife, and a stainless steel straw with a straw cleaner, so it makes it easy to clean it, too. Yeah. All right, so our first question is from our turtle experts. They were our first experts here. So what are the three species of turtle that nest and forage in Anguilla? Green turtle, yep, yeah, that's one. Yep. Can we throw you one? <laughs> I can't see. All right. Yeah, got, uh, got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, oh teamwork, teamwork. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so you have a green turtle. Anybody know what other turtles are over on Anguilla? Hawksbill? Who said it first? <laughs> Who wants to raise their hand to say it Ah, there we go! Yep. All right, we got a Hawksbill, a green turtle. What is the third one? Nope. Leatherback. Yep. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So you have the Hawksbill, the green, and the leatherback turtles. All right, name three diseases. Th so this is from our mosquito experts. Um, so name three diseases that a shoot, Aedes aegypti <laughs> can transmit. <laughs> Malaria? Chikungunya. yep, that's one. Can we throw one out? Yellow fever and Yep, those are the other two. Exactly. And <laughs> uh, we got the other two right here. She got the other two. All right, so the three diseases, dengue, yellow fever, and chikungunya. Well done, guys. You guys are killing it. All right. All right, from our sponge expert, Joe Pollock, we have, what are the three main organisms affected by the vicious circle hypothesis? Anyone? Think on the bottom. What's on the bottom of the ocean? Sponges, yes. Yep, yep. He's a sponge expert. Come on, yeah. <laughs> All right, what else? Two more. Algae, yeah. Yay. He's got it. <laughs> and what else? Come on. What's on our coral reefs? There you go. <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> the next one then. All right, so our seagrass expert, Anna Mates, was talking to us about the invasive seagrass. Why is seagrass important? There you go. Yep. Food, yep. You got one, though. Exactly. She's got one. one? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there you go, yep. Nice. <coughs> Perfect. <laughs> and anyone else? Does anyone else have a use for seagrass? Going once. Going twice. There you go, yep. Nice toss. <laughs> 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 All right, I think. Yep, so we have seagrass. They're, it's an important nursery for juveniles. It provides shelter and food for many organisms, and it reduces wave action, filters pollution. Correct. All right. And next was our conch expert. So what is the magic number of conch needed in one location <laughs> to ensure reproduction? Hundred, we got it. Sarah, in the back, way back there. Yep. <laughs> so you need, and she's next to Adam. I'm like, do not. Try. Yeah. Can we maybe th throw it to the later? Yeah. <laughs> 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 All 
All right, so you, uh, conchs, in order to reproduce, they actually like a large group of conchs to be in the area. So it's 100 adult conch per hectare, and that is their like thriving number. Yep. So do red-billed tropic birds experience higher or lower reproductive success when they retain the same mate and or nest cavity? Higher. Yes. Yep. Back there, we got Sally. She was first. <laughs> yep, so it's higher, guys. <laughs> when they stay with the same ones. <laughs> Next. All right. For our orchid expert, Jim Ackerman, he told us all about orchids and how beautiful yet nasty they are. So, what are the main predators of orchids here on Saba? Rats. Rats. Iguanas, yep. And one more. They're everywhere. Teamwork. Okay, we have rats, iguanas. What's the other one? Goats. I heard it somewhere, yep. All right, our fisheries expert Kamani Kitson Walters told us about fish stock sustainability. So, what is a good management tool to improve fish stocks? Anyone? Anyone? Like, how do we want to ensure? How? What's a good management practice? So, so, so seasonal like fishing. Yes, seasonal yep. fishing. Yep. yep. Yeah. So basically, I mean, point was marine reserves. But yeah. that works too, yeah. as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Protecting them, basically. <laughs> All, right. All right. And then, yep. So scientists estimate whale sound. So this is from Bart Nort, who is our acoustics guy. He did the bat walk with you guys, but he also touched on marine mammals around Saba. They're doing a lot of um, research with acoustic technology. So scientists estimate whale sounds can travel blank miles in the ocean. A Whoa, that was quick. Yeah, 10,000. <laughs> nice. All right. Awesome. 10,000 miles whale sounds can travel in the ocean. Pretty incredible. Next one was that you? Me? Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have more back there. So how many, so this is from our ferns expert, Frank Axelrod. Um, he was just here. So how many species of endemic ferns does Saba have? Three. One. It was one. Yep, so it was only one endemic fern species. <laughs> and Frank was actually the one who found it. So this is a beautiful little picture of him just happy in his, his natural environment. <laughs> All right, uh, let me grab, okay, you got it? All right, part one for Jim Orris, who is our oil and water expert. On average, how long has it taken an ecosystem to recover from an oil spill? Yep. 10 to 20 years. Where, where was it? Being In the back. Right? Yep. yep. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Part two, yep. All right, and then part two to our question. What is the longest lasting casualty of oil spills? What? The back. Mental health, yes. All right, guys, and this actually was quite a shocker for us. Uh, mental health, if you, you guys can see, double-digit increases in depression, PTSD symptoms, domestic abuse, high-risk alcohol behaviors, and suicide for actually generations after oil spills. So environmental disasters like ecosystems can kind of rehabilitate after 10 to 20 years, but mental health is a problem for like generations. Pretty crazy. I think you're next. All right, from our galaxy expert, Sydney Lauer. What four components make up a galaxy? Yep. Stars, yep. yep, there you go. <laughs> what else, guys? What? Gas, yep. yep. Wait, gas or what? Dust? Dust, that works too, yes. Ready? <laughs> Ready? Nice. All right. Anybody and other two? Dark matter. Dark matter, yep. <laughs> nice. All right. So we have dark matter, dust, and stars. I think someone said. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone know the fourth component? We said dark That's matter. That's one, yeah. yeah. No? Yeah. 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 No? No, not, not water. Nope. Gas. Yeah. 
<laughs> gases, yeah. <laughs> gases in the atmosphere. So we learned how galaxies are formed, what they're made of, and lots of other cool things about the stars. So then from Dahlia on Friday, what are two species of coral that the Saba Conservation Foundation is propagating in their coral nursery? Staghorn coral, yep. And what's the other one? Similar? Elkhorn. Elkhorn, there you go, yep. Where's your hands? <laughs> so yeah, we learned that they, Saba has 14 coral trees or ladders that they are using to help propagate new coral. Yep. All right, guys. And this last question. Why is studying the microbiome of sharks important for us as human beings? Now, we haven't learned this yet, but thankfully for you guys, we got an expert tonight that's going to basically explain this and help us understand. So, up tonight, tonight's keynote speaker is Chelsea Black, and let me give you guys a little bit of background on her before she comes up in front stage. Chelsea Black is from North Carolina and earned her Bachelor of Science in Marine Biology from the University of North Carolina, Wilmington in 2016. After graduating, she traveled to South Africa to intern under researchers studying great white shark populations. She is currently a Master of Science student with the University of Miami Shark Research and Conservation Program, where she studies shark immuno immunology. <laughs> Her research is investigating the microbiome of three shark species commonly found in Miami, including blacktip, bull, and tiger sharks. Tonight, she will be presenting on the normal bi microbiome of these three shark species. Please give a warm welcome to Chelsea Black. Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming. Um, so actually, before I get into a little microbiology lesson, I'm going to give a general overview of all the shark research that I'm a part of. Good. All right, so sharks. What can we learn from them? So there's actually a lot of different things that we can learn from sharks. Um, so let's take a glimpse into what it looks like to be a shark researcher in Miami. Huh? Yeah. So while that looks really exciting to be a shark researcher, you might wonder why. Why are we studying sharks and why are they important? So why should we care about sharks? So Sylvia Earle, my favorite quote, she said, sharks are beautiful animals and if you're lucky enough to see lots of them, that means you're in a healthy ocean. If you, you should be afraid if you're in the ocean and you don't see sharks. So a lot of sharks are what are called apex predators, and that means they're at the top of the food chain. So they're actually controlling species below them. So that means they're eating the weak, the weak, the, the weak and the injured um, species that aren't really going to reproduce and be healthy, so those fish. Um, also, they're eating a lot of groupers. So groupers without sharks are going to overpopulate, and what's going to happen is those groupers are going to end up eating herbivores. So the herbivores are what are controlling the algae on the coral reefs. So without the herbivores, we're going to see our coral reefs kind of degrade, and it's just going to be covered in algae, and you're not going to see all those different fish species. So how do we study sharks? So 71% of the Earth is covered in ocean, but we actually know more about space than we do about the ocean. Um, so it's a lot easier to study and map space, so we actually have better maps of the moon and Mars than we do of the ocean floor. Um, when we're looking at terrestrial research, it's a lot easier to study animals on land, because life on land starts in the soil and it goes to the trees. 
Life in the ocean starts at the surface and goes to the deepest point about seven and a half miles deep. And there are over 500 known species of sharks. So there are a lot of sharks in a big ocean. So how exactly do we study them? And what do we do when we encounter them? So one thing that we do when we're out on our research boat is we tag each shark that we encounter. So our most commonly used types of tags are one, the spaghetti tag. So can you guess why it's called a spaghetti tag? It looks like a piece of spaghetti, yeah. So on that tag, it actually has our phone number, our name, um, and it has a unique ID number to that shark. Um, same with this one. This is for a little larger sharks, and this is actually a little message in a bottle. So if you guys were out with me in the field yesterday, I passed around that tag, and you got to feel that. Um, so you unclip it, and inside there's a piece of paper with our information. And so this is useful for if fishermen in Florida or in other areas catch our shark, they'll call the phone number and they'll actually give us a call and say, hey, I caught this shark. We'll say, great, what's the tag number? Can you give us a few measurements? So all scientists take uniform measurements. So one is the pre-caudal length. So that's right before the tail. And then all the way to fork length, where the tail forks. So sharks have heterocircle tails. That means the, the top lobe is actually longer than the bottom lobe. So we measure in between that and then the total length of the shark. So the length can actually tell us the age of the shark. So that's one way that we can determine if the sh shark is growing um, at a healthy rate. So for example, nurse sharks, you guys have a lot of nurse sharks in Seba. They're actually pretty small compared to the nurse sharks that we have in Miami. So the nurse sharks in Miami um, actually mature around 250 centimeters, and that'll be when they're about 15 or 20 years old. However, for example, tiger sharks, mature around 250 centimeters, but they're only seven years old. So tiger sharks grow a lot faster and a lot bigger. Another type of tag that we have is called the acoustic tag. So on the left, I'm surgically implanting an acoustic tag. It looks like a small battery. So this will go inside nurse sharks. And then on the right here, we have a great hammerhead. And you can see the tag sticking out of its dorsal fin. Um, so great hammerheads, we actually have to double the tag up because they're super smart animals and they'll actually try to rub off that tag as soon as we put it in. So we have to get it the proper length so it's not bothering the shark and they actually won't feel it and they can't rub it off. Um, the way that these tags work is around Miami, we have actually deployed what are called underwater hydrophones. And it's this big block that's anchored to the bottom. And when these sharks with these tags swim within a certain distance of those receivers, It'll rec do a little record log and say this shark was at this receiver at this time. So now this isn't active tracking. This is passive tracking because what we have to do is we have to dive back down, pick up those receivers, and actually take out the memory chip and download that data. So that's not in real time. Um, what we're doing for this is we're actually comparing the movement of sharks in around Miami to the movement and boat activity. So we have a master's student who's actually working on a project of seeing how boat noise is affecting the shark movements. So are they leaving on holidays such as 4th of July, or are they staying in the area and not really bothered by it? So that's one cool tool that we can use for acoustic tags. So this is probably what you think of when you think of tagging a shark and tracking it. This is satellite tagging. So this is in near real time you can see that we're attaching a satellite tag to this really big and beautiful tiger shark that we caught off of South Beach. Now, every time she breaks the surface of the water, it's going to ping to a satellite in space, and it's going to tell our computer, hey, your shark, this, her name is Olivia Eve, is in this location. So we tagged her October 25th, 2018, off of Miami, over here. And by March, she was already off the coast of New Orleans, and she's now currently hanging around Texas. So in one year, she's traveled thousands of miles. So that's pretty cool. So why is tracking them important? Why do we want to know where they're going and what they're doing? So one cool thing that we've discovered is a place in ba the Bahamas, we've nicknamed it Tiger Beach. It's full of pregnant female tiger sharks, not a lot of males. So we wanted to know, what are these tiger sharks doing here? But we didn't see any pups, so those are baby tiger sharks. Um, so for whatever reason, they were hanging out here while they're pregnant, but then they leave somewhere else to give birth. So why is that? 
So Bahamian waters are pretty warm. They might be using this area to kind of speed up the gestation period, speed along uh, when the pregnancy will happen. Uh, so the way that we determine, one, if the shark is pregnant, we can actually give them ultrasounds. So we have this really big tiger shark flipped upside down, and we have a waterproof ultrasound machine that we can actually look inside and see. So you can kind of tell up at the top right, there are quite a few tiger shark pups in there. Um, so we want to know, all right, when is she going to give birth? So we've actually developed some interesting new ways to figure out where these sharks are giving birth. So that'll be coming soon, hopefully in the next couple years. But if we know where they're giving birth, then we can protect those waters. Because while they're in the Bahamas, they are within an exclusive economic zone, so they're protected from fishing. But clearly, they're leaving there to give birth. So wherever they're giving birth, they might not necessarily be protected. So it's important to kind of figure out where that's happening. So another cool aspect about our research is we get a lot of people involved and we kind of spread the word about sharks, about science, and why it's important. So we have a citizen science program. So what that means is almost every single time we're out on the water collecting this data, we have people helping us. Um, so normal citizens that get to be scientists for a day. So we work with a lot of school groups. Um, we can take groups of uh, about 20 kids or corporate groups or families who just kind of want to do something fun on vacation and we get them involved in hands-on shark research. So this kid is helping measure a juvenile bull shark. Yes, that's a baby bull shark. You might think it's pretty big, but it's going to get a lot bigger. They help keep the shark cool by pouring water on it because our studies have shown that when a shark is out of water, it heats up pretty quickly. So that's why we try to take all of our measurements within five minutes or less. We also have what is called our FINS program, Females in the Natural Sciences. So again, we're trying to get people involved, hands-on, and we take young girls out with us, and we run the whole trip with all female scientists. So our whole crew for the day is going to be women, and we really want to empower young girls to be involved in the STEM fields, um, tell them that, yes, women can do shark science, you can be a scientist, you can be whatever you want to be, so that's really awesome to see how they grow in just one day and leave feeling very empowered. Another aspect that we do is we take blood from every single shark we encounter. Um, why do we do this? So we know very little about the immune system of sharks. Uh, but what we do know is, unfortunately, almost every shark, their immune system kind of varies. So there aren't really any baseline measurements of what we can compare to. So we don't know what a healthy shark necessarily looks like versus a sick one. So if we're taking blood measurements on every single shark, we can start building up that baseline. So we've actually discovered that an increase in lactate is kind of a stress response. So for example, great hammerheads, when they're on a fishing line, they can fight themselves to death because they get so stressed out trying to free themselves that they build up this lactate and then they will eventually 48 hours later perish. So that's why now in Florida, it's actually illegal to land a hammerhead shark. And as soon as you know that you have a hammerhead on the line, you need to cut it. So that's something that blood work has showed us and has proven. So we're just trying to build up this baseline. So we've also measured the level of mercury and heavy metal concentrations in the blood of sharks in the fins and the muscle. And we found that not only do sharks contain mercury in their fins, but it's actually traveling through their bloodstream. Um, it's going into their muscle. So that's why it's really unhealthy to be eating shark fin soup. So because we are in Miami, we're in a very urban area. Yet there are still a lot of sharks very close to these urban areas. So we want to know what are they doing there? How are they evolving to survive in such an urban environment? So we'll take all the same parameters that we do. We'll do fin clips, blood samples, and we can see kind of what are these sharks eating? Uh, where are they spending their time? Uh, does the population of people affect the population and distribution of sharks and or prey? We also have some really cool projects in South Africa. So we want to know, are the sharks in South Africa, these, the puff adder shy shark, the dark shy shark, leopard cat shark, and pajama shark, for example? So those are, that's a pajama shark. He's named that way because he looks like he's wearing striped pajamas. Uh, they're pretty cute. So we want to know if they're spending their time in marine protected areas or if they're swimming outside of those areas where they aren't protected from fishing. 
So the way that our master students are doing this is they're putting in those really small acoustic tags into these sharks, and then they're also using what are called bruvs to analyze the distribution of sharks in this area. So bruv stands for Baited Remote Underwater Video Surveillance. So this is a non-invasive tool to use to kind of sample and see what sharks are around without disturbing them. So here's a cool example of what some of our bruvs in South Africa have picked up. He's trying pretty hard to get that bait, but his mouth is a little too small. Uh -oh. Forward, back, no. Up. tool that we use to study sharks and kind of a bird's eye view. They don't know that we're watching them. Um, so that's an easy way to kind of survey what kind of species are in the area. And you can compare that, put the bruvs in different places, maybe closer to shore, farther away, and see what's there. So when you think of South Africa, you might think of great white sharks. So we've done a lot of sh research on great whites in South Africa. And over the years, we have noticed that there's been um, a decrease in great whites. So we want to know why and what happens to the ecosystem when we lose those great whites. Sharks are among the most feared, respected, and admired creatures on the planet, but it's amazing how little we know about them. Scientists still don't fully understand the extent of their influence on ocean ecosystems as top predators. This is because their lives and ecological impacts remain concealed by the ocean's surface. But working just outside Cape Town, South Africa, our team has studied great white sharks for over two decades and only now discovered just what can happen to an ocean ecosystem when an apex predator disappears. And it's not what you would expect. Based on results from experiments done under laboratory conditions or those involving land animals, the decline or removal of predators, such as spiders, wolves, or lions, have caused rippling effects down the food web. The story usually plays out as such. The loss of a predator causes increases in the abundance of their prey, which in turn reduces the abundance of the species they feed on. But the issue with understanding the consequences of predator declines in the ocean lies in the difficulty of observing interactions between predators and prey, the secrets of which are hidden underwater. Because of this, it's extremely difficult to detect changes and without a baseline, it's often impossible to determine if and when ecological changes may have occurred. That's why this research is valuable. Located in False Bay, Seal Island is a hotspot for great white sharks, famed for their predatory behavior, where the sharks can be seen exploding out of the water in pursuit of their seal prey. For the past 18 years, our research team has conducted over 8,000 hours of standardized observational surveys in which we recorded over 6,000 great white sharks and documented a monumental 8,000 plus great white attacks on seals. Using these numbers, we monitored annual trends in great white abundance and hunting activity. For one and a half decades, 
great white shark numbers were relatively stable, but in 2015, sightings began to drop off steeply for unknown reasons. In 2017, the unimaginable happened. Great white sharks completely disappeared, sometimes for weeks and months at a time. While the reason for the decline and disappearance of great whites are unknown, it provided an opportunity to see just what can happen to an ocean ecosystem due to the loss of an apex predator. Here, the disappearance of great whites coincided with the unprecedented emergence of an extraordinary apex predator, the seven-gill shark. A living fossil, seven-gill sharks are related to ancient sharks, unique for having seven gills instead of the typical five. In Falls Bay, seven-gill sharks historically aggregated within dense kelp beds located some 18 kilometers away from Seal Island. Seven gill sightings continued to increase at Seal Island, while white shark sightings continued to decrease. During this time, we even witnessed a seven gill shark attacking a live seal in the absence of great whites. In South African waters, seven gills have no equal in the food web, with the exception of the great white shark. Other than orca whales, great whites appear to be the only predator of adult seven gill sharks. We hypothesize that this emergence of seven gill sharks at Seal Island is due to the loss of white sharks, which would have otherwise predated on them and also competed for prey like the seals. Without great whites, the seven gills are free of predators and competitors to occupy the waters of Seal Island. This 18 year study provides new insights into the diverse ways ecosystems are altered following the loss of a predatory shark. The decline and disappearance of great whites from their seal hunting grounds led to the unpredictable emergence of an unusual apex predator from a different habitat. This discovery would not have been possible without long-term monitoring. So he mentioned the words baseline and long-term monitoring several times. So like I said before, we don't know if there are shifts in populations or health until we have all this baseline data. So our lab is focused on a lot of different projects that do a lot of large scale things. However, my research, the microbiome, is a lot smaller. What is a microbiome? So a microbiome, you guys all have one. It is the community of microorganisms that associate itself with a host and have either co-evolved with the host or the host has inherited it through its environment. So your microbiome on your eyelashes is gonna be different than what's on your hands, and that can vary through time and space. So I wanna know, what is the microbiome of sharks? So you can either acquire your, micro, your microbiome through horizontal transmission or vertical transmission. So horizontal, you're gonna pick up that microbiome from the environment, so a shark swimming through different waters, Vertical transmission is the recruitment through inheritance. So that's, was the shark born with it? Um, so we're all actually born with a specific microbiome and it changes over time. But no one really has figured out if that's the same for sharks. So the microbiome of sharks. Very little research has been done on this and I'll touch on what research has been done in a little. Um, but sharks have a biologically active mucus layer just like fish. So if you've ever touched a fish, it's pretty slimy, right? So sharks are pretty similar, but their scales are different than other fish species. So this mucus layer and their scales, which are called dermal denticles, probably provides for a very selective skin microbiome. So shark skin is made up of dermal denticles. And if you've ever felt a shark back and forth, you've probably noticed that it feels really scratchy, almost like sandpaper. That's because of these dermal denticles. So it's the shark's armor, and different species actually have different shaped dermal denticles. So usually faster swimming sharks, like the mako shark, great hammerhead, tiger sharks, they'll feel scratchier because these dermal denticles, there are gonna be more of them. And then they're gonna have a lot more of these valleys. So this is where the shark gets its hydrodynamic speed from, are the dermal denticles. Sharks like the nurse shark, if you feel them, they're a little rough, but they don't feel like sandpaper. That's because their dermal denticles are actually a lot bigger, and they lay more flat on the shark. So nurse sharks, you've probably seen them around here diving. They're usually under reefs, under ledges, they're in rocky environments, and they don't move around a lot. So they, one, don't need to be hydrodynamic, 
And two, they need to have thicker skin that's more protective of these rocky environments. So you've probably also thought about, okay, what does dermal denticles, why? Why do they have them? Well, one, speed. Two, they actually act as a natural anti-fouling. So if you guys think of whales, you think of, they probably have barnacles on them. But have you ever seen a shark with barnacles? No. So there's something about these dermal denticles that are inhibiting the growth of other organisms on them. So scientists have actually successfully mimicked dermal denticles and they've covered a hospital surface with this. And this surface, it's called the sharklet AF, actually successfully inhibited the growth of staph and E. coli. Those are two infections that you don't want. They also took it a step further and wrapped burn victims with the same sharklet and it increased healing rates of wounds by up to 64%. So there's something about them that make them pretty special. So previous research, what have other people done looking at the microbiome of sharks? So some scientists have look at, looked at thresher sharks in California, and what they found was the shark's microbiome displayed high diversity and abundance for different bacteria species. And there were two bacteria species genuses that actually were overrepresented. So there was a really high abundance of them. And that was one, Pseudoalteromonas, and two, Idiomarina. So the first is responsible for hindering marine fouling organisms. Th so that would be preventing these growths of, let's say, barnacles or algae on the shark. And the second is actually a bacteria that helps detoxify heavy metals. So what does, that, what does that tell us? So probably thresher sharks are spending their time in areas where there might be levels of toxins in the water. They also move throughout the water column and they have a high spatial distribution. So by looking at the types of bacteria found on them, you can kind of tell what kind of habitats they're spending most of their time in. Black tip reef sharks. So this paper actually just came out a couple months ago and it compared wounds on the gills of black tip reef sharks versus a healthy area, which was the dorsal fin of the shark. So scientists wanted to see if, once these dermal denticles are kind of insulted, are other bacteria species going to invade these injuries and kind of change the microbiome, or are they gonna fight off these infections? And so what they actually found was the microbiome didn't really change between the injured versus the healthy areas of the shark, which is the opposite of what they thought would happen. Um, they actually noticed the differences between where the sharks were. So sharks sampled in the north actually had different microbiomes than those sampled in the south. So that means that they were probably responding to the waters and not necessarily to the injury itself. Spinner Atlantic sharp nose and sandbar sharks. So scientists have investigated the gut microbiome. So in humans, a deviation from a normal gut microbiome is actually what leads to irritable bowel syndrome, but we're not sure how it helps sharks. And so what they found were very selective bacteria in the guts that were in, um, accelerating nutrient absorption. So they had specialized bacteria in their guts that helped them absorb more nutrients from their prey. Bacteria is not always good, right? So we have good bacteria and bad bacteria. Sometimes the good can actually overgrow and kind of turn into infection. So bacterial disease in sharks is relatively rare, um, mostly because we probably don't see it in the wild, um, but where we do see it is in aquarium or lab settings. So the bacteria that's primarily responsible for these infections are of the Vibrio species. Uh, so they're mo the most significant group of marine pathogens. So that'll cause meningitis, cysts. This poor sandbar shark has a huge cyst on its nose. Um, but it could be that this shark in the aquarium, he was rubbing his nose against the tank, and it kind of wore down the normal microbiome, and then other outside invaders kind of took over, and a growth formed. But a lot of times these will actually resolve themselves, um, or they can actually be treated with antibiotics. There was an odd case of juvenile salmon sharks that stranded on the coast of California, and they actually found in their brains carnobacterium. So this was the first report of this bacteria in any shark species. But again, that's not really saying a lot because we haven't sampled that many. Um, so it could be that this is common to salmon sharks. And they thought, okay, why is it only juvenile sharks? Well, one, it's possible that they build up over time in immunity to this bacteria, so adults might not be susceptible to the infection. 
Or it could be that the adults were just in deeper waters, and when they died from the infection, they didn't wash the shore, so we didn't see them. They think that the bacteria actually altered the brain and caused the sharks to be confused, and maybe either they died first and washed ashore, or they were so confused that maybe they just swam into shallow water and beached themselves. So there are a lot of gaps in knowledge. We really don't know what's normal. We say, okay, Carnobacterium, it's the first time we've seen it in sharks. But people really aren't sampling sharks, so we don't know for sure. So I'm trying to fill some of these gaps and see, all right, what is the normal microbiome of these wild sharks? And what is it doing for them? Does it differ across different habitats? So my research is in Miami. I'm focused on three main species that I commonly encounter here, there. One, black tip, two, tiger, and three, bull. For each of those that I encounter, I take several cell swabs. The first is gonna be from the mouth, so inside and around the teeth. The second is going to be inside the gills. Third, around the dorsal, and then if the animal has a wound. So the reason that I'm doing these different areas is because remember I talked about the dermal denticles and how they're inhibiting the growth of things. So sharks actually have dermal denticles inside their mouths, but they're spread out, so it's not gonna be as much. Same with inside their gills. So the concentration of dermal denticles is actually going to differ in the mouth and the gills than it does on the outside, kind of that main area of skin. Now, looking at the wounds, for some reason, the bull sharks and the black tip sharks in Miami keep presenting with this odd looking, looks like infectious dead skin. Um, it's usually always behind the dorsal, so you can see this large bull shark. I'm sampling this patch and I wanna try to figure out what it is. So originally I thought maybe since it's site specific that it's a parasite because it's growing behind the dorsal fin. Um, but so far, no parasite. I've actually identified staph in this, but it's possible that staph is in the normal microbiome, so that may not necessarily mean that it's a staph infection. So I kind of want to figure out why is it these two species? What is it? Is that normal? Um, there are some records of it in other places, but no one's really tried studying it. So that's a big part of my research, is trying to identify what that is and why. So I want to know how the bacteria differs across the different tissue sites. So I also compare all those tissue sites to the water. So I'll take a water sample. I'll take all of those samples back to the lab and I will culture them on these agar plates. That's kind of food for marine bacteria. And it's gonna start growing these bacteria colonies over 48 hours. After 48 hours, I check, I'll do some counts, and then I'll isolate the colonies. Then what I do for each colony is I actually extract DNA. And we can send that off for sequencing and we'll get matches on. There's a 90% chance that it's this species of bacteria. Additionally, for every single sample, I also make a microscope slide. On the microscope slide, you can actually tell the shape of the bacteria colony and whether it's gram negative versus gram positive. So I'm looking at these three main shapes, so that can kind of tell you what family that's in. Um, down here on the left, that's actually an example of staph or strep. It looks similar under the microscope. So it's either strap, staph or strep in the mouth of a tiger shark. So that's pretty interesting. It's going on that, but not that. We're having some technical difficulties. <laughs> Please enjoy this photo of staff. Sorry, guys. Oh. 
Oh, we're back. All right, yeah. Thank you. All right, so I'll also do what's called gram staining. So this is how we determine whether it's gram positive or gram negative. And what's that, what that is telling us is whether the bacteria is susceptible to antibiotics. So examples of that would be strep and staph infections. Or if it's resistant, so that would be it can't be cured by antibiotics or you'll have to use a combination of different types. And that's examples of E. coli and cholera. So what have I found so far? So actually in the mounds of bull sharks, I've primarily found Pseudomonas bacteria. So this is a common genus of bacteria, and it has a lot of different species and strains. However, it has some of the scary ones in there. So some of the bacteria that can cause sepsis. Um, normally, you'll encounter this bacteria as in hot tubs, and you'll get hot tub rash or swimmer's ear. But if you have a weakened immune system, this can actually cause really severe infections and actually death. So this is a pretty scary bacteria that is just possibly normally living in the mounds of bull sharks, and they seem perfectly healthy and unaffected by it. So it's possible that that's a bacteria that they use to kind of fight off other bacteria. In the surrounding water, I've actually found very different bacteria than anywhere else on the shark. So they likely do have a very selective microbiome, and it differs from what's in the water. So what I've found in the water is primarily microbacteria. So this can also cause infections um, that include sporadic infections of the blood and wounds but it's not on the sharks. So why is investigating the microbiome important for sharks? So sharks face multiple stressors, human-induced, climate change, urbanization, and we want to know how they're evolving and adapting to kind of overcome these things, stay healthy, and live in these environments. So the microbiome is going to be an um, emerging measure of health for them. So we can actually use this to measure how healthy the shark is. Um, so we can determine if there is a deviation in this normal baseline. But first, we have to determine what the baseline is, so that's really what my research is focused on. Why is investigating the microbiome of sharks important for us? So remember that crazy bacteria that I was talking about in the mouths of bull sharks? So if someone is to be bit by a shark, you kind of want to know how you're going to give them antibiotic treatment. So if you know what is normally living in the mouths of these sharks, uh, and then you can actually know how to treat it. Um, so it might be multiple types of antibiotics versus just one. And so you can actually test the strains and the antibiotics themselves to see what would be the best. This can also, so in medicine, we can also use those dermal denticles um, as decreasing recovery time for wounds or covering hospital surfaces and decreasing the growth of bacteria that could be harmful for people in hospitals. So just using this as the microbiome, the microbiome of sharks as an assessment for our oceans. So we can kind of use sharks as a tester. So they can be like our water quality testers. And so if we're testing sharks and we see that in areas closer to shore, their microbiome is really changing versus in pristine areas, then it probably means the water quality closer to shore is bad. And we can kind of see when these shifts are occurring um, and start measuring this over time and space and really using it as a tool to see, one, what's going on with our sharks, two, what's going on with our ocean, because healthy oceans need sharks, right? So thank you all for coming and listening to my little microbiology lesson. Um, and then thank you, big thank you to See and Learn for having me in Queens Gardens for hosting me. And everyone who joined me on the field project yesterday, I rambled on about nurse sharks and then we finally So her question is, so in humans, um, a lot of our blood cells come from bone marrow, but sharks don't have bone marrow because they're made of cartilage, right? So where, where is their immune system coming from? And that's, the answer is we don't know. So that's why we are doing all this blood work and we're trying to figure out what, how do you assess their immune system? Because it's not going to be the same in humans. So exactly, we don't know. So that's why we keep testing it. Good question. And then I saw you.
Oh, thank you. <laughs> really, really excellent. How many times have you done this? How many times have I done presentations the, 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 or this? Yeah. Um, this is actually the first week that I've really presented any of this. So, thank you. All right. Anything else? Any other shark question? <laughs> yes. Have you done any research on uh, sharks off the San Diego coast, where we have we have seven gills and smooth hounds and leopard sharks there? So her question is, have I done any research off the coast of San Diego? And the answer is no. Um, there are people working out there, but our lab specifically has not. So I haven't had the opportunity. And I saw a hand over here. No. I, I, I'll just ask you questions online. Um, yeah, no so um, what are the dermal denticles made out of? Like, are they made out of something more like keratin or? more like chitin or because you know how different kinds of things can hold on to different kinds of bacteria more or do you even know what they're like what they're made out of so her question is what are dermal denticles made out of um and i actually think it's a combination of different proteins keratin um, but I don't know exactly what the chemical composition of dermal denticles is. Um, but it's more, it's not necessarily what they're made out of, but it's actually the shape that is what's inhibiting the formation of these uh, biofouling organisms. So if we went back to that photo of the microscopic image, they looked like they had a lot of U's and valleys. Um, so it's really hard for microorganisms to settle in there because that's on a really small scale. So they'll actually kind of be carried away with the water flow. So it's more about the shape, not necessarily what they're made out of. What else? No else? No more questions? Really? <laughs> Did I answer all of your short questions? In the back. Maybe. Uh, you've been talking about the uh, bacteria around the mouth area of the sharks. Yeah. Uh, for example, the Komodo dragon, completely different area of the world. <coughs> they are very poisonous and lots, lots of bacteria around their mouth. Is there any correlation to that or not? Any correlation between the bacteria in the mouths of Komodo dragons and sharks? Well, first I got to figure out what's in sharks, right? Um, and then we could actually do some comparisons, but. Yeah, that's pretty interesting to see how it differs across different species and different habitats. So they've actually done a lot of research um, on the microbiome of corals and looking at what kind of bacteria is on the surface of corals close to humans versus farther away. And what scientists have actually found is that closer to human disturbances, these corals actually have a higher abundance of bacteria than those farther away, but that it completely differs than from what's in the water. So they think they're kind of building up this protection and using that bacteria as kind of a protective layer to defend off other organisms. So then when they're farther offshore, they don't really need that because there's gonna be less bacteria than closer to shore. So I'm kind of trying to use that same model that they've used in corals and coral reefs to look at that and in sharks. Other questions? <laughs> okay, Go for it. <laughs> okay, so, uh, uh, for humans, for instance, a lot of our normal flora we get from our moms in the process of being born. And uh, sharks also give birth to live young. So yeah. uh, is there anything on like trying to track for the mother shark's birth canal normal flora and the normal microbiota on the shark skin? All right, so her question is humans, they get their microbiome from their mothers and also that changes as the mother gives birth. And then also your microbiome shifts within the first few weeks of your life. So she asked, all right, how is that differ or the same from sharks? Because sharks also give live birth. And the answer to that question is no one's looked at it. <laughs> yep, so they've actually looked at that in fish. So in farmed fish, they've actually measured the microbiome of kind of the egg casing. And then after the fish were born, after they hatched, measured it again, and then after the first feeding, and they tried to see when that microbiome shifted for these fish. And for that species, it shifted actually after the first feeding. So while it did get some of its microbiome from birth, it actually completely shifted after it started ingesting prey, and then it remained stable over time. So for farmed fish, it was more related to what they were eating versus what they were born with. Um, but again, that would be extremely difficult to do for sharks because you would have to have shark from the start all the way to the end and measure it over time. And a lot of shark species really don't do well in captivity 
Um, so that would be a difficult thing to study. But again, you'd have to really plan for that and do that over a long period of time to really get that measurement. It's an awesome question. Anyone else? Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Chelsea, for that awesome presentation. Another round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. All right, it is now the moment you all have been waiting for all month long. We are about to draw the raffle prizes. Woo! <laughs> you don't sound very excited. Come on, guys. Woo! All right. Do you wanna? Do you wanna draw? Take a name. Sure. All right. Or we can have people in the crowd do it too. But which one do you wanna do? Okay. All right. Which one do, should we start with? Um, left, top left corner. Or should we say that one's the last? So That's a big one. Okay. Well, first off. So first off, guys. Sorry, we've never done this before, so <laughs> we're figuring out how the best method to go out this is. But just to let you guys know, so there, we're still waiting on some of the official certificates for these prizes. And so we're going to write your guys' name down. If we don't have the certificate with us, we're going to mail it to you guys. So, you know, facing a lot of uh, challenges here, but we're, we're doing it. All right, so first we're going to draw for, which one? The knife first? <laughs> we're going to go for the Don Two Fairy, and then we'll go in a nice, beautiful little circle. All right, <laughs> so. Uh, kind of. Do you want to shake it more? We can put this down. And we can have someone else take it too. Yeah. All right. All right. So, drum roll, please. <laughs> and rye. R Y. All right, All right no one. I won. Yeah, so you might be watching on Facebook. Woo! Roger Young. Roger Young. Okay, Roger Young. Congratulations, you are the winner of the Dawn Two Ferry tickets. Okay. And next we have the wine gift basket from Shea Booba. So here we go. Drum roll, please. And the winner is Brandon Davis. Woo! Okay. So congratulations to Brandon Davis on your wine basket. Up next, we have that beautiful knife made by John. And the winner is, let's see. Sure, Emily's going to pick it. The winner is, drum roll. Guys, drum roll. <laughs> Carla Smith. Oh. Carla. Carla. Congratulations, Carla. Carla, Smith. Carla, Carla Smith. Smith. There we go. Carla Smith. And then do you want to announce <laughs> All right. What? Yeah, she's writing it down yeah. there. Yep. All right. <laughs> she won the beautiful knife fight, John. So now we're going to be drawing for the two-night stay at Travel Inn in St. Martin. Tiffany, would you like to do the honors? Oh, that's another winner. Roger Young, you're another winner! <laughs> All right. Our next draw is for the first prize from Aquamania for the Sunset Sail for Two. Drum roll, please. Do you want me to take it? <laughs> Drum roll, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Mike Gill. Mike Gill. Hey, there you go. Sunset sale for two, congratulations! You can actually grab that one! <laughs> we have it right here! Back there. 
Raise your hand. There you go. Congratulations. Congratulations. All right. Next up, we have two round trippets, uh, trip tickets on the Edge Ferry. Drum roll, please. Dinner for two. So, drum roll, please. to claim their prize. And we got no upcoming events other than sleep and wine for us, of course. <laughs> but yeah, thank you guys so much for joining us for Learn 2019. Really enjoyed this past month with you guys, so thank you so much for everything. Because of you, it is what it is. So thank you guys. And... Miami is known as an international community and the hub of trade and logistics for the Caribbean and Americas. A leader in the freight logistics industry, Eric Trans has served the Caribbean region for more than 30 years, with a footprint that has grown from one island to now serving the majority, as well as Central and South America. Caritrans is an NVOCC, a non-vessel operating common carrier, meaning it has the same responsibilities as a shipper without owning the vessels or planes. Its primary customers, individuals who ship clothing, electronics and other personal items, and occasionally cars. Most of the stuff that they're sending is because they, they don't get it there. So for us to provide it on two services, air and ocean, we can give them a choice of how fast you want it. So, if you ran, want it really fast, we're going to send it by air, you're going to have it next day, sometimes even the same day. That on-time service has been the key to Paris Trans' success. 
whether shipping by air or by sea. The company moves about 5,000 TEUs of freight each year, more than any NVOCC in the region. And since it joined the Saltchuk family of transportation companies a couple of years ago, Carry Trends can offer customers even more shipping options. Other NVOCCs, they depend on other uh, shipping lines that are not part of their family. So they need to rely on whether they're going to sell or not, whether they are late or not. It doesn't happen to us because it's part of our family of, uh, of companies. We, we control the service that we give. Quality service is what keeps customers coming back. Customers are treated like family, and when they leave to research competitors, it doesn't usually last long. They have left and they have come back because they've said that, you know, nobody does it better <laughs> than great jobs. So because of that relationship. That exceptional service includes consolidation. Customers can have freight sent here and stored for free for up to a month then consolidated and shipped on to the islands and Americas. A perk for the region's growing small business market. Puerto Rico is an expanding market for carry trends, about the size of Connecticut and rich in history and culture. Puerto Rico is home to many pharmaceutical manufacturers, as well as a thriving tourism industry for which Carib Trans moves raw materials and supplies. But serving small businesses is still the company's bread and butter here in San Juan. Businesses like Aldera Cafe, a local coffee company, owner Alfredo Rodriguez started growing coffee beans at his mountain farm about 20 years ago. He recently ordered a variety of new equipment for his farm and shop. He uses Carib Trans because it consolidates shipments, which cuts down on the number of times he has to pay the Puerto Rico import tax. Not many companies want to do that. They want only big cargos and uh, maybe half container or full containers, but they don't, they don't want to consolidate because it's, uh, it's more difficult. Turning challenges into opportunities is what Carib Trans does, and that includes helping to grow small businesses like Caldera Cafe by taking the hassle out of shipping. We uh, can be a gateway to expand their, their business in the Caribbean and, and back to the U.S. Wherever they can, they can sell their products, we are also going to be a partner for them. The customer dedication has made Carib Trans what it is today. Now as part of a larger family with more transportation resources, Carib Trans hopes to grow beyond its current market offering services to additional Latin American ports and eventually Europe and Asia. But even when it becomes a global logistics company, Carrick Trans wants to stay true to its roots, always providing personalized, reliable customer service and a commitment to the communities it serves.